Good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, all the way from Winnipeg. It's minus 32 there this morning. <laughs> this is, I didn't even bring my winter coat. It's quite wonderful here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I know the genesis of this um, came from the Madrid conference in April last year, which uh, I'm one of the founding mothers of Safe Sport. Uh, international and that was our inaugural conference and I'm I'm thrilled to be here with Safe Sport Iceland um, and uh, and the generation of the the learning that will go on today um, it's a it's a mighty task that I've been given which is to lay the groundwork uh, to lay out all that's happening in the international world and to bring it home for you in a way that you'll understand um, you will see that I've provided a, a two-pager um, which is, um, you might have picked it up at the table on the way in, so it's a summary sheet. It's either both sides or two pages. Um, and it will, it will help you follow. I'm aware that uh, I'm doing this in English. Um, um, I've done it with Ann Tevis, who is the chair of Safe Sport International, and she's much wordier than I am. So some of the slides are packed with words, and I have tried to thin out the words. But in some cases, they are very busy slides. So I tried to uh, soften the impact a little bit by giving you a, a sheet to follow. OK, who am I? Uh, first of all, I'm a Canadian. I'm a researcher. Uh, I've been working in this area since 1993. Um, that was my first publication. Um, and it was seconds after I got tenure at the University of Winnipeg. So after I was a permanent appointment at the university, then I began work in sexual harassment and abuse. Um, I'm an Olympian. Um, I was part of the IOC consensus statement building, in, the one in 2005 and the one in 2016. And I was part of the UNICEF work that we did on um, violence against children around the world and making that come home to sport. Um, and I was also the author of the first um, national study of high performance athletes in Canada looking at the nature and scope of abuse. And that resulted in the first statistics we had anywhere in the world on this, and it also resulted in the first book on this. And that original study has now been replicated in various versions in a number of nations, and the figures hold true. So I'll reporting, be reporting a little bit on those. So I come to you with a long, I'm old, right? <laughs> I've come to you with a long breadth of experience and I'll try and, um, I'll try and um, organize it in a way that's useful. So I have five main points, the purpose, some background, a little bit on definitions and scope, a little bit on what the international landscape looks like now, um, where are we now in this, and recommendations, and I want to focus specifically on three areas. The policy one, that's where the busiest slides are, and I'll jump through them. Um, on compliance and on education and research. And I have clear recommendations in each. Um, and they're not recommendations for Iceland. They're recommendations for anybody who's doing work in this area, in including these are recommendations for Canada, the recommendations for the Caribbean and the UK and so on. OK, everybody OK with that? Am I speaking too fast? No? Good. OK, purpose, provide an overview of the field for you, and to give you some, something concrete, um, actionable, um, doable at the end that you can go away with. Um, the background, most important. Um, when I went to look at uh, information about Iceland, it was difficult to find. Uh, if I spoke Icelandic, it would be easier. <laughs> um, but. Um, I did find that uh, something like 90% of the population participates in sport. Sport is very important to who Iceland is. Um, and that you're very successful in a number of sports. So not only Olympic, but in Paralympic, in strength sports, and this glimma, which I could never find even a picture of. Um, and it might be glim or glimma? Glimma, OK. Um, I know that sport, for me, it was very positive. So I know that sport is a vehicle for um, uh, enjoyment, for growth, for development. It's a vehicle for culture. It's a carrier of culture for Iceland. Um, it is where the children are. So in our work in, in, um, in sexual abuse, if I were an abuser uh, and looking for children, 
I would be going to sport because that's where the kids are. They're also in the schools and in the <coughs> churches and on the playgrounds and so on. But sport is one of the places where the kids are. Um, I also have learned that uh, music and art, along with sport, are being used here in Iceland to reduce alcohol and drug uh, abuse. And that's a lesson that is my takeaway back to Canada, that sport can be one of these vehicles combined with other things that will help. We have major problems in this as well. Okay, depending on, those are all the good things sport can be, but depending on whose hands it's in, sport can also be a place that is not always safe. Um, the recent, recent cases in sexual abuse uh, for athletes in every country have percolated up. Uh, what I've learned since coming here is that the Me Too movement and the Me Too um, uh, report, I haven't actually seen it, but I think those are perhaps the first figures in Iceland. Yeah, so uh, other countries have uh, less than that. Um, some countries have much more than that. So, so that was something that was instructive for me. I couldn't find a baseline or a, a threshold or anything like that in the in the literature. Um, extensive research confirms maltreatment of athletes around, uh, around the globe. So it's not a problem that's unique to here or unique in my country. It might take different forms. Um, the efforts that have been made in various countries are often fragmented and piecemeal and uncoordinated. Sometimes they are redundant. Sometimes they work at cross purposes. Uh, a whole lot of work needs to be done and that sport around the world has this kind of exclusive status or privileged status. So it has escaped the scrutiny that maybe other areas of, um, of social life have not. Um, and that means people who are, um, who are abusers in sport also escape scrutiny or may have protection because sport gives them a place where they're not asked questions or not, not as much as expected of them because they are producing athletes. So what we are presenting here today is about the health of sport and it's about the health of its participants and every one of you here and everyone you know has a role to play in building sport up. Sport needs everybody in the tent to do this work. I'll let that speak for itself. Okay, safe sport is where we have an athletic environment that is respectful, equitable, and free from all forms of violence. So that's, that's my statement. That's my, the one I, I go to every morning. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get a respectful, equitable, and, uh, and uh, free from violence sport experience. So when I'm coaching my rowers, that's what I'm after. When I'm working on the board, that's what I'm after. So... Who is vulnerable um, to the harms in sport? You see the language here is now intended harms. So I'm not talking about just sexual abuse. I'm talking about harms that are intended. We sometimes intend to hurt. Uh, who's vulnerable to these harms? All athletes, all participants, all ages. Um, I was going to say both sexes, but all sexes. Um, children, particularly the girl child. Not exclusively by any means. Para-athletes. Athletes who are, if I use LGBT as a shortcut, is that okay? Okay, uh, LGBT athletes, indigenous athlete, athletes. So in my country, we have a, a base population that is indigenous, and they are extra vulnerable because of their indigeneity. Um, you don't have that here, I don't think. You don't, you're all indigenous, right? <laughs> to some degree. Um, and also um, those who are disadvantaged in other categories. For example, uh, those who are more, more poor or those who are uh, geographically distant. You have that here. You have people who live in remote communities and they have perhaps less access to some things than people who live more centrally. Okay, the definitions. This is one of the wordy slides. Um, I just want you to look at the top one, which is safeguarding. Um, so this is the language we use for the actions we all take to ensure that all participants are safe. So any kind of work we do that keeps people safe, that's safeguarding work. So there's nothing magical about the word. Um, and then the two bottom ones, the violence is the standard uh, definition that comes out of the UN Convention for the Rights of the Child. 
And the gender-based violence, which I'll focus on a bit today, is the abuse and power over another person based on their gender, their gender identity, the expression of that, or perceived gender. So now that trans athletes, for example, are accepted under the IOC rubric, we now have trans athletes in our local, I have a trans athlete in my local club. Um, and the challenge that puts us uh, to in terms of being providing a respectful and safe environment free of violence for that athlete is really an interesting challenge. It's very exciting stuff. Okay, and what harm? Now I'm going to skip this slide and I'm going to go right to the graphic, which you have on your sheet. This is, this is kind of a summary of, from the IOC level, our discussion on the, the, um, the kind of harm that athletes come to in sport. And along the left side, you'll see discrimination. So down the panel, down this panel here, discrimination, all the different kinds of discriminations or the combinations of those. The more combinations, the more vulnerable the athlete is. Then as you move across, now we're under harassment and under abuse. And you'll see that psychological is the first word you run into. What we have really learned in the last three years is that the portal into abuse is through psychology. The first abuses um, that we see, the first harassments, are psychological. And then from there, then you get the other forms of abuse. And here they're just, we've just put physical, sexual, and neglect. We could put several things in there. The mechanisms are below. And these would be contact, where you hit someone or you're sexually in contact with someone. Non-contact, you know, where, well, I don't need to explain it, I suppose. Um, um, cyber. Negligence, bullying, and hazing. Um, and then on the right side of the slide, where you look at impacts, there's one for athlete impacts. And this is no, not, not exhaustive, but it'll give you a picture of the impact on athletes of abuse. And it's not momentary. The abuse does not affect the athlete in the moment only. It is a lifelong pattern that then, that then is there. So the impacts are many and varied and affect different athletes differently, but they are there and they are profound. And we need to take care of the, we in sport need to take care of those athletes. Okay, it's not just listening to the complaint, but it's taking care of someone who has been damaged by sport. The organizational impacts, and these are sometimes why you find sport organizations unwilling or <laughs> unable to move because these are the impacts for them. Reputational damage, um, loss of players and fans. You know, if a sport becomes known as a place where abusers are, then the fans disappear, and perhaps the players disappear. Um, loss of sponsorship, reduced medal tally, which is important at the national level, reduced public confidence in the sport, loss of trust, and asset depreciation. So those are all things that give organizations the willies, like, Right? Embracing these issues and moving forward and doing a good, good job with them means that these organizational impacts are actually diminished. You, have, you become outstanding in your field because you're an organization that can deal with these issues effectively and can protect athletes in sport. So it's a way of turning these things, these impact statements, into, um, into uh, positive orientations for your sport. So this, this slide is a really good slide if you're trying to bring it home to people, how it all makes sense. Okay, and uh, a lot of this, a lot of what I'm presenting has um, uh, information about the child athlete. I just wanted to put in this slide to say, well, it also applies to adults uh, in sport as well. Uh, we have uh, athletes with impairments who are adult. We have, um, we have athletes who are poor, who are adult and vulnerable because of that. Um, so just, this is a list to just remember that we're sometimes talking about adults as well. They, they need as much protection, perhaps different kinds of protection than children. Okay, um, and then I have uh, two slides here on uh, definitions. So this one is the gender-based violence one. This is probably the core. The abuse of power and control 
over another person based on their gender identity, gender expression, or perceived gender. It's well recognized inside of sport and outside of sport. In fact, the start of the, spar the start of safe sport would have been the gender equity movements in the women's movement and the look at violence against women. The start of this kind of research would have been from that genesis. So it's well recognized. Um, the, um, the effects are long lasting, as I said, and it has health implications, which ties in ministries of health, health and well being, so you can bring them into sport to help you solve some of these problems. It also costs society in the long run. So there is a cost of illness study um, that was done in maybe two decades ago in Australia. And it said the cost of the health, um, the cost of health care in Australia would go down, uh, I think, 3% of the GDP if violence in sport was addressed. It's that, uh, Australia is a nation that loves sport as well. Um, in Canada, what we've done is we've come up with It's Time, Canada's strategy to prevent and address gender-based violence. And uh, the Minister of Sport has put in $30 million, and we're kind of on the move on that one. In Iceland, uh, what I was able to find was the statement, the zero tolerance statement. So I, I found that in the records, the zero tolerance and accountability. Um, and I, it's, it's a really good start. And then what's next? I couldn't find the what's next. So uh, I'm anxious to hear today what, what has followed or what will follow. Um, that's a really good start, is to state your end goal. Okay, the second definitional slide is on intended harm. Um, and the word here is intended. Um, that we, these things do not just happen. Harassment just doesn't happen. It is intended. Someone is intending to hurt. Someone is intending to harm you by neglecting your needs or by abusing you. Someone is intending to harm you by over-medicating you or introducing you to drug regimes to help your performance even though they're uh, illegal. Okay? So non-accidental harm, intended harm is some of the language you'll see out there. Uh, it includes the same things we've been talking about, just the emphasis on is on the intention or the non-accidental nature of it gives us a little access into who the perpetrators are that we didn't have before. Um, it's perpetrated against athletes knowingly, deliberately, or perhaps negligently. Sometimes people do things with athletes without understanding that it will harm them, like overtrain some of the overtraining programs and stuff. You don't intend to harm the athletes, but, but they're out there. Okay, it threatens ethical and social basis of sport and the physical, emotional, and mental health of athletes. My main point on both the gender-based violence and the intended harm is that all of this is counter to performance. Unless you have healthy athletes who feel they can bring their whole self through the door when they come to perform in sport, you can't get good performance. They can't perform very well your sport won't perform very well. So ha pr producing healthy athletes is a very large part of our responsibility. So it runs counter to successful athlete performance. I'd love to see some research out that looks at this directly and gives us some facts and figures. We don't have that anywhere in the world yet. We know it intuitively. Okay, the current landscape, this is how much is out there. So from... My study, 22.8% of the high-performance athletes in Canada, or recently retired high-performance athletes, that was within the last five years, had had sex with persons in authority over them in sport. So that's their coaches, their medical doctors, their physios, their athletic trainers, those people. People who had authority over them, the team selectors. So that's more than one in five. It was an astounding number. Um, and when you look at how it's replicated around the world, some have less and some have more, but this figure holds water. It isn't just a one-off. It really is out there. Um, two to eight percent of children in sport are victims of sexual abuse. This is Sylvie Parent's work. Um, and those figures vary depending on what definition, what population, when they're studied, what they're asked. 81% uh, of participants experienced homophobia in sport. This is the big study that came out of Australia called Out, Out on the Fields, Kitchen and Denison. 10,000 athletes participated from seven nations. 
80% experienced homophobia. Um, 65 to 85% of athletes experienced psychologically abusive coaching practices. This is Gretchen Kerr and uh, um, Sterling, Amy Sterling. We have a, I don't know what it looks like in Iceland, but we have a lot of work to do in sport. 31% um, of persons with disabilities versus 9% of persons who are not uh, disabled are victimized by abuse. So four times more likely. And we have para sport now. We have Special Olympics. We have a lot of things going on in this area. So this means we have to be a little bit more vigilant there than perhaps we have been. OK, this is the recent data from Belgium. I'll just get the circles drawn on immediately. Um, so this is uh, Tina Vertolman's work. Um, so these are, um, these are the types of abuses, psychological, physical, and sexual. This column is across the entire sample of 4,000 athletes, or 4,000 sport participants. So 4,000 of them, <coughs> that's the average of the amount of psychological abuse, the amount of physical abuse, the amount of sexual abuse. The circles show the increased vulnerability of the other, uh, of the other categories. So if you're an ethnic minority, your chances, not of psychological, but your chances of physical and of sexual abuse go up. And if you look way over here at athletes with disabilities, the numbers are off the chart. So this is, uh, this is very important work. It comes out of Europe. These are European statistics. But it, it gives an indication of what um, how important the word vulnerable is. Athletes are more vulnerable if they also fit into these categories. Okay, that's fairly clear? Yeah? Okay. Then the next one is a, a little chart. This is called the Stage of Eminent Achievement. You'll see it again um, because I'm going to talk about the child athlete later on this morning. Um, in this one, the, the experience of the athlete in terms of novice to elite is on the, um, um, the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have their age. So from young to old. This category here is where they're pubescent. So for females, it's a little earlier than males. But where they are pubescent and where they are in elite development, so where it's penultimate to being named to either the national team or maybe your Olympic team or something like that, that's their most vulnerable period. So there is some research there that supports this. I would like to see more research, obviously. I think it's uh, intuitively it makes pr pretty good sense. There's some research that said this doesn't hold water, but um, it's a good way of looking at sport and looking at uh, what happens when athletes are in that pubescent area that pubescent age, I guess, and when things are a little bit jumbled and we're putting a lot of demand on them in, in terms of performance. So there's, there's an area there to pay attention to. Okay, um, non-recent abuse. Uh, I wanted to put this one in. Um, you're going to hear it later today as well. No athlete's story, no matter how old that story is or how far back the abuse was, is irrelevant. Every story is relevant. Every story can tell us something about how to do sport better. Every story means there's someone there who needs our help and needs our support. Okay? So, so just because it didn't happen yesterday doesn't mean it's not important to who we are right now. Non-recent abuse has lifelong impact on sport and on the person or persons who have been abused. Um, it affects everyone around the individual. Obviously, it radiates out. Um, I've got the 90% of the cases examined in the recent football inquiry in the UK, the, the hydrant cases, dating back to the 50s. The next slide I have is a graphic that I'll show you. Um, those cases that were revealed up to 2016, some of them were back way back, like in the 1950s. And re-victimization is an issue. When athletes do come forward, they often get re-victimized by the complaint process or the legal process. And I'm not sure what happens in Iceland. I don't know what the situation is here, but uh, it's worth thinking about. Okay, this is Operation Hydrant. And what I wanted to show you here was 
On this axis here, it goes from uh, 0 to 60, number of cases per year. And on this axis, it goes from 1952 to 2016. And the peak here is uh, 1980, 1982, I think. Yeah, 1982. Um, so this is, these are the non-recent cases of abuse that came up. It shows the span of years of abuse that were reported. Um, it also shows the reduction. So here, this reduction here is when the child protection legislation came into the UK. Um, so it does show the impact of policy on sport. It does reduce the number of cases. Not immediately, but the cases will again begin to fall. Okay. Um, I just slid this in here. This is a little bit of embargo data. Um, Canada on February 10th uh, will release its, uh, an investigation that was done by CBC, which is like our BBC, our national broadcaster. Um, um, what they did was they gathered all the cases since our, our big, we've had a number of big cases, but one of our big cases was Graham James, um, an ice hockey coach, well-documented case, um, award-winning coach who abused a number of athletes, went through several um, court cases, was convicted, put in jail, released, um, went to coach in Spain, youth, youth hockey, uh, left Spain, went to coach in Mexico, was pardoned, our government pardoned a sex offender. He came back to Canada, he was charged again, now he's in jail again. Um, anyway, since, since the Graham James case, which is about, it, it came to the courts in 1998-200, uh, 2000, um, CBC gathered all of the cases that have affected youth athletes, um, so it's almost two decades, and that information will come out. It'll have the number of people charged, it'll have the number of convicted, uh, which will, uh, I, I mean, I can't give you the numbers now, but you could watch the press and see these come out, because we think the conviction rates are low, and this will show something a little bit different. Uh, it shows the number of victims, and it offers breakdowns. Um, by sex, by age, by area of the country. Uh, it also offers, for the first time, large scale by sport, which we've been trying to avoid because we think the problem is across sport. Um, but this is a look at which sports are um, really, um, really overrepresented amongst the youth sport criminal cases in the country. So I wish I could give you the numbers, but not yet. So it's a teaser. Okay, where are we now? And this is, remember I had A, B, C, D, E, this is D. This is where all the noise is. This is the policy work, lots of, lots of noise on the slides. Where are we now? We're actually in great shape in many areas of Europe, uh, Northern Europe. Uh, I would say Canada is coming on stream again. Australia is doing quite well. Uh, there's some quite good things happening in Laos, of all places, in Zambia. Of course, Norway is the pinnacle. Norway is uh, ahead of the pack on most things here. Um, so there's lots of resource out there for Iceland. There's lots of resource to move with. And you can shamelessly borrow from all of these projects. So there's the Eras Erasmus and I Protect project, which is Erasmus is about education and training youth. Um, and I Protect, I'll, I'll have a slide up later of it. Um, the Council of Europe and the, the Lanzarote Convention Standards, you may have seen this, which is one in five, right? So it's a way of signaling one in five in sport, one in five. Um, the Oro Plato e Bronze, this is um, good practice codes and helping organizations adjust um, their policies and so on when they have cases. This is Gloria Viseras in Spain. Uh, there's some work going on. Notice the list is not long. These are international federations. So in my federation, FISA, which is international rowing, there is nothing. There is some work going on, but they certainly haven't contacted me. Um, there's the International Ski Federation, which has international level policy. The International Tennis Federation has international policy, and it's refreshed its policy. The International Equestrian Federation is almost ready to release now. This is it. So this is an area where an awful lot of work needs to be done around the world, the international federations. Um, 
The IPC is the International Paralympic Committee. Um, they've been quite engaged in the work. They started from a place that said, if we have no claims, we must be doing okay. And they have, in about five years, just completely reversed and um, are working on getting prevalence data and so on. Um, and there are lots of national examples. I've kind of bunched them at the bottom there. Um, so that's part of where we are now. There's, there's lots more. Um, in terms of um, recommendations to the European Commission, so 2012, the recommendation first went forward, safer, better, stronger, prevention of sexual harassment and abuse in sport. The international safeguards, that's the second bullet, that was, um, that was announced in Johannesburg. Um, it was tested through 50 sport governing bodies. This is, this is led by uh, a founding group. Uh, uh, the main people, I guess, are, uh, are in England and involves UNICEF to some degree. There is an advisory board now, and those safeguards are now available, freely available, and they work. Eight points, get yourself going. These are what you need to, to do safeguarding work in your sport. Um, European projects, um, you can see them there. The EU, EU Commission is involved, uh, and Safe Sport International, which I represent here, I suppose, has a declaration of principles from 2014, and uh, we held our first international uh, clearinghouse summit in Madrid. Uh, our next one is, and I wrote down the dates, April 15th to 17th, 2020, in Quebec City, Canada. Put it on your calendar, April 15th to 17th, 2020, Quebec City, Canada. So we'll have a repeat of Madrid, different, bigger scale, on your calendar. Okay. Um, where are we now uh, on this one? This is the last of the where are we now. Uh, we have the IOC consensus, consensus statements to guide us. Um, and there are, there are ones on harassment and abuse and non-accidental harm. They're there. But there are other related uh, consensus statements that are useful as well. Um, there is, the, uh, there is the, obviously the IOC uh, materials available to you, the most recent being the, the Athlete Protection Toolkit that came out in 2017, which is receiving really good... Um, really good um, uh, feedback. Um, and there also is the current Athlete Protection Working Group that uh, Prince Faisal from the IOC is leading. Uh, the United Nations has been involved in, um, from, the, from the perspective, uh, the United Nations has been involved from the UNICEF perspective on uh, children. Uh, there was a study on violence against children. And when we looked at it, we said, where's sport? We got access to all of the original data, and we, they had research looking this way at violence against children. We researched all the data this way, looking at sport, recreation, leisure, swimming, anything to do with sport, recreation, and pulled out a whole other body of data that had been missing about violence against children in sport. The problem was that when they did the UNICEF, um, they did the UN study on violence against children, they asked governments. And the work that was going on in many nations hadn't gotten up to the government. It was still at lo levels that, that weren't being reported. So that was instructive for us, that sometimes uh, we can go over old data and find things that are really useful. Okay, I've been giving my five minutes. This is the Erasmus slide. This is on, uh, remember Erasmus is about learning and youth development and so on. So. It's a very busy slide, but it's a project where organizations can go through the Erasmus project, and at the end, if they're successful, they will get the I Pretend stamp that they protect. They will be able to say, our organization is, belongs to the I Protect. We have our stamp of approval, or our seal. Um, and the other example I have is of the safeguarding toolkit of the IOC, which is, again, freely available to you. Okay, um, the only point on this slide is that sport governance used to be about structure and funding and running the organization and so on. Now it is um, getting more heavily involved into athlete welfare, <coughs> that we see sport governance um, includes athlete welfare as one of the key parts of its business. 
Um, so the way in which we used to govern sport is not the way we will be governing sport in the future. Okay. Uh, she's my timekeeper. Okay, so the recommendations in three areas. Okay, policy, compliance, and research. I'm going to skip right to the, <coughs> look at all those slides. Good, good, good. Safeguarding, those are the safeguarding rules. These are the recommendations for policy. National policy base on safeguarding all levels of sport. Include the duty of care, including the penalties for failing to report. Uh, be gender explicit. Have it linked to funding. No policies, no procedures, less funding. Establish a national arm's length legislative body to address concerns. So this would be of the ombudsman sort or an organization that stands beside sport, works with sport to ensure compliance. And develop an all-important network of stakeholders from outside and inside sport who can help. The legal profession, the business world, those people already know what they're doing. We can bring their resources into sport and do a better job. We don't need to create it all ourselves. Okay, compliance. Sorry, I'm just going to skip right to the recommendations. Recommendations. Have a duty to report very widely communicated. This means bystanders as well. This is particularly to bystanders. Penalties for willful blindness. Draw on existing Icelandic models from business as law. Reference checks for safeguarding. And Havard is going to say more about this this afternoon. Um, start and maintain a single national database and communication about perpetrators, which I gather you have already started to a small degree. Um, arm, when we haven't in Canada. We haven't been able to get one going. We a lot of resistance to that one. Arms length investigators and adjudicators and a pool of trained sport welfare officers. So pretty, pretty nice set of recommendations about compliance. Okay, education and research. Uh, no, I'm going to back up one. Education and research. What we have learned is that perpetrators move from place to place. They move from sport to sport, or they move within the sport from here to over there, sometimes without their reputation following them. So we have some work to do there. Uh, sexual perpetrators often have multiple victims. We know that. Havard will talk about that. Bystanders are complicit when we know that virtually every single case of sexual abuse that comes forward comes forward with the knowledge other people knew about it before and did not say. And what you get then is you get people who are victimized feeling that they don't have support and being re-victimized because nobody else is saying, nobody else is seeing what they see. Nobody is, is courageous enough to speak out. And so that compounds the damage and lengthens the damage. Um, so the work of, we have a lot of work to do with bystanders. Some forms of athlete abuse are normalized, particularly in sport. We have, you know, ice hockey in Canada. It's like, a, you know, they fight. It's all normalized, right? There are parts of sport that really we have to, we have to pay attention to. We have to, um, you know, clean up what we're actually doing in the performance of sport. Athletes' voices are largely either silenced or not listened to, rarely coordinated, rarely asked. And sport organizations in general lack the capacity to act. So there's, listen to the athlete voices. So the, rec oops, back up. I have two slides left. So the recommendations for education and research. One, make sure that education and prevention are the responsibilities of everyone to get educated and to be part of the education. Engage in or link with the latest research. The education that we produce for sport must be up to date. It must be informed by good facts. It must be um, nimble. It must be responsive. It must move all the time. We can't produce something and then have it work for 10 years. You know, we're constantly on the edge with education uh, materials. Adopt an ethic of care approach which means that as organizations, we take our duty to protect athletes seriously and to provide care for those athletes. We take that all seriously. And finally, develop culturally meaningful and appropriate curricula. 
if sport is this important to Iceland, then developing materials that are, that are linked to that culture and the strength of that culture becomes really important as a carrier for it. Okay, last slide. Key messages. Sport and child protection professionals need to collaborate better. Like, we in sport need to reach outside to those outside of sport, particularly the welfare people who know what they're doing uh, and work together. We need to understand better what the risks in sport are. Um, sport people may identify risk to children in sport because we're working with them closely in sport. We can be part of the solution in helping to identify children that are being abused outside of sport. We can, we can have a vigilance there. Um, organized sport needs uh, the expertise and cooperation of everyone, of governments, of child welfare and protection agencies. It needs cooperation from the law and the business world, uh, my world of academia and so on, to address safety in sport. And help is at hand, right? As I said, there's a lot out there, particularly the international safeguards. Bring them into Iceland, use them, they're yours. And a uh, final note, that sport is a place of resilience. My next piece of research is going to be on um, people who have been abused in sport actually turn to sport to rebuild themselves. Um, and I want to look at what that looks like, because I know sport is a good and healthy place for the, the majority of people. Anyway, thank you very much. How did I do? Okay.